Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to continue studying elimination reactions. Let me briefly introduce to you the plan of the current lecture. First, we'll continue our discussion from the previous video about the influence of different factors on the elimination mechanisms and we'll evaluate it for the E2 and E1CB mechanisms. After that, we'll have a little pause so we will explore one beautiful example of the E2 mechanism that takes place in the famous citric acid cycle. Finally, we'll learn how carbon ion stability, leaving group ability, the polarity of solvents and base concentrations influence the E1CB mechanism. Let's go! Now let us turn to the E2 mechanism and discuss it in more detail the factors that favor it. The same discussion about E1 mechanism we have started with the analysis of the substrate structure. So we will follow more or less the logic of the subsequent discourse. We concluded that E2 is a concerted mechanism, which means it proceeds via a single transition state and does not lead to the formation of any intermediates. In contrast to E1 mechanism, where the stability of carbocation had a positive influence on the probability that reaction will follow this mechanism, the opposite is true for bimolecular, say 2 elimination. The more unstable is the possible carbocation, the less is the probability of its formation, so the higher is the probability of E2 reaction to occur. For instance, methyl and primary alkyl halides react only in E2 fashion as the corresponding carbocations are too unstable. The secondary alkyl halides can follow both mechanisms. In order to correctly predict mechanism for them, other factors should be taken into consideration, namely base strength. The same is true for tertiary alkyl halides. If we compare the rates of E2 elimination for tertiary, secondary and primary alkyl halides, we will notice that reaction rates decrease in this row. It might be confusing, since we are used to steric hindrance having a negative influence on kinetics. The bulky substituents usually decrease the rate of the reaction, as they significantly decrease the accessibility of the reaction center. In other words, they are making the interaction between reactants less probable. However, tertiary halides react faster than secondary, and secondary faster compared to primary. There are two main reasons for that. First, the bases are not as sensitive to steric hindrance as nucleophiles because protons that should be abstracted are small and usually on the outsides of the molecules. Second, the more highly substituted alkene is, the more stable it is. It is supported by thermodynamics of hydrogenation reactions of different alkenes presented on the slide. So the higher is substitution grade, the less exothermic hydrogenation reaction is. The same trend is also valid for corresponding transition states. The higher is substitution, the more stable is the transition state. According to the well-known Arrhenius equation, the more stable the transition state is, the bigger is the rate constant, so the reaction proceeds faster. The effect of the leaving group is the same as for E1 mechanism. The better it is, the faster CX bond is cleaved, thus favoring E2 mechanism. It is important to note that good leaving groups often represent weak bases, and they should be weaker than bases initially used for elimination reaction. The influence of solvent is directly linked to the base strength and its effect, so let us study the effect of the base prior to that of solvent. We have already mentioned that an increase in base concentration favors the E2 mechanism as it is present in the rate law. The pKb value of the used base in contrast to the E1 mechanism is also important for bimolecular elimination. To be more specific, Bases with low pKb favor the E2 mechanism. In other words, if we use a strong base for elimination reaction, such as presented on the slide, we definitely deal with the E2 mechanism. The last factor to evaluate is solvent. Chemists have noticed that change from polar protic to polar aprotic solvents significantly increases the base strength. This happens since the base is surrounded by a huge solvation sphere in protic solvents. The solvent molecules are capable of building strong hydrogen bonds with the base. The hydrogen bonds are depicted with dashed lines 
and the base as usually with capital B. For instance, let us take a look at the solvation of ethoxide with the water molecules on the slide. It makes the base more stable and thus less basic, which has a negative influence on the probability of the E2 mechanism. In contrast, polar aprotic solvents such as acetone or dimethyl sulfoxide do not form hydrogen bonds with solid, in this case base. Salvation sphere is held only with dipole-dipole interactions and van der Waals interactions which are much weaker and thus easier to break. It leads to the increase of the basicity. Simply speaking, polar aprotic solvents enhance E2 mechanism and sometimes can lead to the change from E1 to E2 elimination by a significant increase of basicity. But what does it mean for us? It means that the correct prediction of elimination mechanism for secondary and tertiary halides implies first analysis of base strength and secondly the influence of solvents on the base strength. And here again is a brief summary of factors favoring E1 mechanism. All in all, it is the unstable carbocations, good living groups, high base concentrations, strong bases, and polar aprotic solvents which favor E2 mechanism. Now it's time for the second little pause. During the last few minutes we have discussed bimolecular eliminations. I would say that this mechanism is the most popular in organic chemistry among all elimination mechanisms. However, it is quite complicated to find any biochemical reactions which proceed according to the E2 mechanism. It is rare, but still possible, to find an example of how nature uses it, for instance, in our bodies. Before discussing the specific reaction, ask yourself, have you ever heard about the citric acid cycle? To my mind, the majority of people who are watching this video have heard these words at least once. Nevertheless, I would like to remind you, the citric acid cycle is the central metabolic hub of the cell. It is the gateway to the aerobic metabolism of any molecule that can be transformed into an acetyl group or dicarboxylic acid. You can see the complete cycle on the screen now. The cycle is also an important source of precursors, not only for the storage forms of fuels, but also for the building blocks of many other molecules, such as amino acids, nucleotide bases, cholesterol, and porphyrin, the organic component of him. The citric acid cycle, in conjunction with oxidative phosphorylation, provides the vast majority of energy used by aerobic cells, in human beings greater than 95%. It is highly efficient because a limited number of molecules can generate large amounts of NADH and FADH2. As usually, we are interested not in the whole cycle, but in one specific reaction, namely the conversion of citrate into isocitrate, mediated by enzyme aconitase. The reaction proceeds by an intermediate named cis-aconitate. The reaction scheme is now presented on the slide. You can clearly see that both reaction steps are reversible. The one is dehydration and the second is the addition of water. I would like to stress the fact that both eliminations of water from citrate to cisaconitate and from isocitrate to cisaconitate are proceeding via E2 mechanism, what is proved by stereochemical outcome. Look at this beautiful enzyme in general and the reaction center especially, where the isocitrate is bound. The strange orange-yellow cube is the iron sulfur cluster Fe4S4, which is essential for dehydration, because it binds the living hydroxide anion. Let us clarify what is happening here. The white dashed line represents the forming iron-oxygen bond. The blue dashed line is the cleaving carbon-oxygen bond, and the yellow one is cleaving hydrogen-carbon bond and red one is forming oxygen-hydrogen bond. The reaction yields cis-aconitate, and we have already discussed. Now, you can inspect the two-dimensional representation of the mechanism. The citric acid cycle is one of the key metabolic pathways in aerobic organisms. That is why inhibition of its enzymes leads to fatal consequences. The well-known inhibitor is sodium fluoroacetate. It is used as a rodenticide in many countries, 
for example in Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Japan, etc. to protect plants from rats. It also helps to control the population of possums, deer and rabbits. Sodium fluoroacetate binds tightly acondytase, thus leading to the increase of citrate concentration in blood. Furthermore, it allosterically inhibits PFK1, the key enzyme of glycolysis. As a result, cells cannot metabolize carbohydrates and produce energy. Lastly, I would like to mention that it is also poisonous for humans. Now, it is time to finish the break and return to the factors that favor the E1CB elimination mechanism. I hope that you are alright so far and ready for the last part for today. We are almost done. The last mechanism that we should discuss is obviously E1CB, monomolecular elimination from conjugate base. I hope you are already used to the logic and sequence of factors that we are going to evaluate. The first step of this mechanism is represented by the formation of intermediate carbonion. It is formed due to heterolytic dissociation of CH bond. The last step is just the abstraction of a proton which yields pi bond. Do you remember? We have discussed previously that the rate law of E1CB mechanism proposes the dependence of rate from concentrations of base and substrate because the base is responsible for the formation of intermediate carbon ion. The higher its concentration is, the higher is the rate. It means that carbon ion stability plays a crucial role in E1CB mechanism. You have definitely noticed the similarity to E1 mechanism, where we have discussed the stability of carbocation. Let us take a look at factors that influence the stability of carbon ions. The first factor is obvious the number of adjacent carbon atoms. In this case, the more highly substituted carbon ions are less stable compared to those less substituted. In other words, methyl carbon ion is more stable than primary, the primary is more stable than secondary, and tertiary are least stable. It is clear that the order presented on the slide is opposite compared to that of carbocations. And it is simply because of the positive inductive effect plus I of alkyl groups, which causes the increase of electron density on central carbon, thus decreasing its stability. The positive inductive effect is depicted with dashed blue arrows. Now, we have understood that carbon ion stability is vital for E1CB mechanism. But how can we then stabilize carbon ion? Substituents with minus I effect and of course substituents with negative mesomeric effect minus M have a positive influence on carbon ion stability. The first group can withdraw electron density from central carbon, thus increasing its stability. The negative inductive effect is depicted with dashed red arrows. Some examples of substituents that possess minus I effect are represented on the slide, for instance, halogens. The second group can efficiently delocalize the charge, thus stabilizing the whole system. In addition, minus M substituents allow the formulation of more resonance structures, what also enhances the stability of the corresponding carbon ion. On the slide, you can see the typical example how NO2 possesses minus M effect and the resulting resonance structures. In addition, some typical minus M substituents are also given. Summing it up, electron withdrawing groups stabilize carbon ion and thus favor the E1CB mechanism. If they are not present in substrate structure, then elimination from conjugate base does not happen. The last factor to discuss is living group ability. Previously, we have seen that better living groups favored both E1 and E2 mechanisms. It was so due to the fact that CX bond cleavage was included in the rate determining step and thus higher living group ability favored both mechanisms. In the case of the E1CB mechanism, this statement is only partially true. Even though CX bond cleavage represents rate limiting step, the good living groups disfavor E1CB mechanism. This, from the first sight counterintuitive trend, agrees with our previous knowledge. 
E2 mechanism competes with E1CB mechanism. So good living groups favor simultaneous cleavage of CH and CX bonds, thus enhancing E2 mechanism. In the case of poor living groups, CX bond is cleaved slower than CH bond, so making the formation of the carbonine intermediate possible. Lastly, electron withdrawing living groups, such as fluorine, can stabilize carbonine and thus enhance E1CB mechanism. We have already discussed before that E2 and E1CB mechanisms compete. Also, calculations suggest that the activation energy of E2 mechanism is generally lower than that of E1CB by 30 to 60 kJ per mole, which is quite a substantial amount. That is why E1CB is quite rare. Now, let us examine once again an example of E1CB mechanism, acrolein formation. It is important that in this case OH left without prior special activation, for example, tosylation or protonation. It is quite an unusual case when OH plays the role of living group without any activation. For instance, it does not happen in nucleophilic substitution mechanisms or in E1, E2, but in E1CB it is possible. Ultimately, E1CB is quite a rare mechanism that competes with E2. Carbonine stabilizing substituents and electron withdrawing poor living groups enhance elimination from conjugate base. As usually, here is a brief summary of factors favoring E1CB mechanism. All in all, it is the stabilized carbon ions, poor electron withdrawing living groups, and high base concentrations that favor E1CB mechanism. On the last slide, you can see the summary of today's lecture. We have discussed everything here, so you can read and learn it by yourself. So you will be able to understand your own weak and strong parts regarding today's lecture. That's it for now. Let's make a small recap of what we have learned today. We have begun with a thorough discussion of how various factors influence the E2 mechanism. Then we had a little pause and discussed the role of the E2 elimination mechanism in the citric acid cycle. Lastly, we have determined the influence of the same factors as before on the E1CB mechanism and summarized all the necessary information in one beautiful table for convenience. I would like to remind you that if you have any questions related to this video or any topic in chemistry, biochemistry or pharmaceutical sciences, you are more than welcome to ask them on our website or in the comments below. Don't forget to give us a like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much for your attention and we'll meet once again in the next video.